Thank you so much for watching Rift TV. Now this interview is obviously with video, but I don't interview everybody on Zoom. That's why I put it on my Talkin' Rock with Meltdown podcast. We talk to rock artists from all over the genre. So check out Talkin' Rock with Meltdown wherever you get your podcasts. And now to today's video interview. And there he is, the legend. Mark, how are you? I'm doing good, man. Excellent. Good Just, to see you. Uh, feeling at home, actually, right now. I, uh, getting ready to go on that Monsters Cruise and then play M3 and then, uh, get out to you guys. Uh, th this is going to be the, uh, uh, smugglers. Yep. That's right. Yeah. 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 yeah we never fun. played there. No, it's, it's, it's kind of a newer building, a newer facility, yeah. but you're, you're going to love it because, uh, Slaughter just played there about a month ago and, uh, they got this gigantic American flag right over the stage. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was just talking to another journalist about, uh, you know, all the history we have there, uh, you know, with Pine Knob and just the whole, you know, like when they changed the name, it was like, I don't know if it was offensive or just we had so much history. You, you know, I think people were happy when they changed it back. Am I right? Yeah. Or Oh, yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah, well, they changed the name because, you know, they got sponsorship rights, you know. Yeah, oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah so then, then they, they changed it back to Pine Knob. But, yeah, you guys have been coming here and playing here and, I mean, in Detroit for, what, it's got to be 40 years, right? I've even told somebody, uh, you know, when when our genre kind of was going through the 90s, you know, when, um, you know, the Nirvana and the new music and, and everything was happening, you know, we were still playing and still making music. And we had a number one song in, in Detroit. You know, it's like they're, they're Sticking with us, you know, they don't care what's swimming by right now. They still want to rock, you know, so I've always really loved that. Yeah, I don't you know, want to. Know, I know that you guys are in great white, and I don't want to, you know, fish for comments, right, or, or whatever. But <laughs> I was just talking with uh, Joe Perry last week, and he said, and same way with Gene Simmons and all this stuff, but it's like there's something in the water in the Midwest, isn't there, when you come and play a rock show? Uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, definitely, no doubt about it. It's uh, Detroit Rock City. You know, all, there's a reason they call it that. I mean, um, just all the legends come from there, it seems like. Um, and there's definitely something going on there that you can feel. And the fans just gravitate. I mean, they much just roll out of bed and just crank music or something. That's that's what it's done to seem that way. Yeah. I mean, it, it does to me when, when we play there, it's always like a special deal. And we have so many friends. It's like our guest list just, just is insane every time we play there, you know. We now, were so you, uh, speaking of, of Ted Nugent, uh, speaking of the Motor City, were you influenced by Nugent growing up? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Nugent was a big deal. You know, we played with him probably 10 or 15 times. And one time, this was this is like my claim to a great moment. At, you know, we opened for Ted, and we were playing in London, Ontario, and I was on the side of the stage, and he he's going, like, check this out, he's going, how about that great white? He goes, they got the rock and roll spirit, and there's a spirit in the air tonight, and, they, and he's going, yeah, that you know, and then he, it was like he was talking nice about us. Leading into Wang Dang Sweet Fun Tang, it was like it was like the moment I liked because when I was a teenager, that album, you know, was such a big deal, uh, you know, uh, that you know to play with them, have them be really nice to me, and then uh, we almost jammed with them this one time um, when he was in Damn Yankees. Mm. He came, but he came down to the show because we had ties with Jack Blades, and he was in Damn Yankees and. Uh, he came down to the show, but we didn't have time to jam with him. But he came backstage when we played uh, some gig because his wife was a fan. And he goes, this better be good because Teddy will be watching. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's not going to make me nervous, right? <laughs> and uh, he goes, I didn't know you could yank it. After the show, he told me that I didn't know you could yank and crank on that thing like that. <laughs> I can't tell from that song on the radio. <laughs> That's funny. You know, I just talked to Richie Faulkner from Judas Priest yesterday, and I'll ask uh, you, I'll ask you the same question I asked him. What was the song that made you a rock fan? He said it was a uh, Voodoo Child from uh, Hendrix for him. But what about you? 
Um, I think, you know, when I heard uh, "Waiting for the Bus" by ZZ Top, that mm-hmm. was that was a big moment. But also, I remember being a teenager and hearing "Highway Star," and that kind of drove me into a coma. In, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that it, that that kind of was the song that gets you ready for school and and whatnot. But uh, yeah, there, there's so many of them. I'm such a like geeky fan of, of music and and bands and stuff that. Um, but the guys I listened to, it, it's funny. I kept changing. It was like I wasn't trying to be disloyal. It was just I wanted to be Carl Santana so bad when I was 14. It was like, please God, just strike me and make me Carlos. You know, <laughs> because I loved the way he played that much. But then. I'd switch to Nugent and then I'd go to Billy Gibbons, ZZ Top, you know. So uh, it's because they were all so great, you know. Yeah, have you had a chance to, to, to meet all these guys? Have you had a chance to meet all your rock and roll heroes? Yeah. Yeah. And and here's what I have to say about that. Every upper echelon person I met from Billy Gibbons, his wife, uh, you know, Blackmore, whoever, have all been soulful, down to earth, greatest people ever. The only people that have ever been kind of short or maybe it might be considered maybe a little rude or, or whatever are people that think they're supposed to be up there with Billy Gibbons <laughs> and deep purple and stuff. But every, every band we've ever toured with, whether it be Judas Priest, Scorpions, you know, all these bands, they kind of took us under the wing and, and you know, taught us things, it, it, you know, and most of what I, got from all that wasn't you know like how to play or whatever i was told by rudolph shanker to kick ass maximum amounts when you're on stage but it was mostly how to treat people that's what i took because they all treated everybody the upper echelon bands you know the bands the easy tops and the you know whoever uh scorpions and stuff like that they want the whole night good they want the opening acts to kick maximum right and, and do well they don't want everybody to suck and give them horrible lighting and you know, then they're the bitch and rock stars. They mm-hmm. want the whole night. They want the crowd to get their money's worth. So I, I actually touring with the Scorpions one night, I didn't have the greatest show of my life. And Rudy said, Mark, you have to play hard out there, man. You have to play hard, kick ass. And, and all this, I never forgot that. And it was before cell phones. So I'm thinking I got away with one. It was really bad technical night. And, you know, and then he takes me down this hallway with his arm around me going, Mark, you have to play hard, man. Because <laughs> I was distracted when everything's going wrong and your amp's not working. You, you, you get in your head and, and, and it's just a horrible. And he noticed it. I thought I got away with it because it wasn't like it was going to get 200,000 hits the next day. You know what I mean? Right, right. We didn't have, we didn't have cell phones. Right. Thank God that's over with. Now we can move on to the next show. <laughs> you know, That's done. But if, yeah. Does that phrase go through your head sometimes when you might not be having a great show? Do you think about that? Uh, well, what I think about, you can't do anything about technical, but it is I do, you know, forget about all the travel and whatever, and just take that, you know, time on stage. I want to impress people. Mm -hmm. I don't want to just be entertaining or, or whatever. I want people to walk away going, Holy crap. That was badass. Yeah. I mean, that's my goal. Mm -hmm. If I only end up entertaining them, then it is not the worst thing in the world, but, but I really want people to get their money's worth. That's, that's my whole goal. And yeah, sure. I learned a little something from from that exchange, but um, but like I said, these guys they treat us so well. You know, we were so green on Judas Priest. You know, mm. we never played arenas every night and all this stuff. This is like new to us. We're green as hell, and they made us feel comfortable. So we've always treated our opening acts that that way. You know, we always. You know, when we get an opening at or, you know, anybody that's ever open for, I don't care if it's Shanker, the Bullet Boys, you know, we always, we always treat them with respect, you know, and, uh, 
Have a good show. Kick ass, man. Do your thing, bro. <laughs> yeah, that's, that, that's the way it should be. And it's funny because the people that are on the upper echelon, they know they're there, so they can be nice to everybody. I think it's the, the people, lower ones, they want everyone to think they're bigger than they are, so they act like jerks sometimes. Yeah, it's like, uh, you know, if somebody was saying to Michael Jordan he couldn't play basketball, I don't think he's going to argue with that guy on the internet. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's true. So you bring in uh, – <laughs> Uh, uh, Brett Carlisle last year, uh, and, yeah. I mean, you know, a 25 year old guy. I just saw the guys from Skid Row, and of course, uh, Eric. I've seen them a couple times now with Eric. But uh, yeah. talk about the uh, shot of adrenaline that 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 gives your band. Well, here's the funny thing: it's uh, we had uh, Andrew Freeman in the band, but he he was uh, his loyalty was to Last in Line, which is. Uh, you know, a great band with Vivian Campbell and Vinnie Apice, and it, it's just a wonderful band. And, uh, you know, they're making records, and, you know, it's a big deal. But it's kind of a secondary band. It's like when Def Leppard's playing, Vivian has to go play with Def Leppard. So right. then he sits around, so he wants something to go to. But the only problem is when they get busy, we can't be having hodgepodge of singers all right. the time. So Brett sat in. And he blew us away so bad that it not only the people there that night and us, but it became world news. It was in Germany, I mean, Italy, the UK, all the dirt mags mm -hmm. that are online that normally just want to seek dirt and find out, you know, horrible things about you so they can make that the headline. Said the guy's great and nice. we'd be fools not to get him. So it happened quite by, not by design, but he was just sitting in and um, he just brings it every night. He's just turned 26 and it's kind of funny, but when he stands next to us and we take photos, it's not like he's standing with, you know, Crosby, Stills, and Nash or something, you know, <laughs> not, not that in nothing against it, but I, you know what I'm saying? It's like, he just looks like a dude in our band. Mm -hmm. It don't look. Like we, we got a 13 year old kid in our band and what, what the hell are you doing? You know, it, it, but he really brings it. And I've been having him out here where I've been recording down at Tracy G's who used to be in DL. Okay. He's a good buddy, good buddy of mine. And we've recorded a lot of tunes and he's singing on new material and it's killer. The guy has such a good voice. Do, do, do you guys, uh, does he ask you questions about the the eighties and the stuff? Does, does he, does he talk to you a lot about that or no? Uh, a little bit, but I'm really uh, surprised by his maturity at his age because I know I wasn't, you know, I was excited about everything and, you know, just wigging out. And he's like, what's next? You know, he, I mean, he's not taking anything for granted, but he's not wigging out over anything. You know, mm -hmm. he just goes on stage, handles his business and he's just a cool dude. I, I'm really surprised by that. Now at his age, you guys had money, you had fame, you had the chicks. Uh, how does a how does a twenty five year old guy handle that? He had chicks coming in. <laughs> oh, I'm, ta I'm talking about you. <laughs> oh, oh, oh! When you were oh, twenty five, you mean, I mean, from, you know, oh, we were um, You know, it, it it was a little bit scary to, to be honest. Um, as far as just the whole arena, the environment. You know, we're coming out of people's backyards. I mean. We played clubs, mm -hmm. you know, and and so to get in that arena environment and having girls come down, I mean, I've never bragged about that because that's what they're coming to the show to see us. Mm -hmm. they, they're coming to be with us. It's not like because I, I'm great or because <laughs> I'm very good looking. It's just because I have a guitar and I play in an arena. You know? <laughs> <laughs> You know, if, if, I, if I was in a cubicle somewhere, I don't think they would look at me twice. You know? <laughs> That's funny. So you just mentioned, uh, you know, uh, working on some new stuff. So what can you tell us? Yeah. Um, just putting stuff together. We're, we're getting ready to collaborate with the band. Uh, we're kind of busy for the next couple of months. So I'm just trying to cram it in every time I can and have Brett out here because he lives in Alabama. I'm in L.A., so I have to fly him out. He stays at my house for like a week at a time. And uh, we drive down to Tracy's. He lives an hour away. And so um, we're just trying to put it together. We're also talking about how we want to do it. You know, do we want to put out, just keep it old school and put out like 13 songs on a record or, 
we want to do a couple of videos and put out maybe five songs at a time. I mean, the world's changed so much that we're, you know, we want to talk to a lot of people and see what the best way to do that is. We're not really sure. So I'm just, in the meantime, just making music, yeah. you know? Yeah. So do you guys have anything demoed out or, I mean, or you guys? Yeah. Just, just yeah. I've been cool. making demos. Oh yeah. yeah. We are making full demos. Um, not with the whole band. I'm just doing it with the drum machine. I'm playing bass. I'm playing all the guitar. Brett's harmonizing with himself and me. And I, I'm going for finished songs. I mean, I'm finishing the songs. Mm -hmm. Playing them for the band. But they want to collaborate on some things and throw their ideas in. And I want that too. You know, and one thing I don't do is just like shoot things down too quick. I, I try it. I live with it. And then t that way I can tell them why I like it or why I don't like it, hmm. you know, intelligently instead of somebody comes with an idea. You go, no, man, my idea is already the greatest. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so I kind of learned to, uh, you know, that's part of collaborating. You want to give everybody a chance to, you know, make it a group effort. Yeah. And so do you, do you have any timeline as to when the whole band might, you know, is, would it be like after the summertime, after touring, you guys might yeah. have a video? Yeah. Yeah, because we have so many gigs. That, um, when we go to record, it, it's really difficult to play gigs in between that. I, I don't really like to do that. I just, I want like, uh, you know, maybe three weeks straight where we don't have a, a show. Right. That way we can get things done and everybody's there every day. You know, it, it no longer takes six months to do a record. I mean, our, our last one we did with Michael Wagner only took us, really about six weeks mm -hmm. you know so with, with this one we didn't you, have the lyrics yeah yeah you're right um would you like with this one would you put the uh would you like just soak up and listen to the demos for a while and then get in the studio and be like completely prepared then you take you said it takes three weeks well uh like right now the band's listening to this stuff and they want to get together and you know i want to see you know they they say they love what i've done but they also want to, you know, jam and maybe w something might change. Right. So, I, yeah, that, so that's I guess that's what I'm saying. It's like if uh, if 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 you guys get done with all the demos, with all their ideas and everything, then you can live with them for a little while. Then you go in and record them. Is that how? Is that kind of how it works? Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly uh, like before we did the last album. We got in this kitchen area, and it was like, "What do you got?" And I'd play them this riff, and they go, "That's pretty cool. Let's work on that." And mm -hmm. we go out in the practice room and we hash through and try different parts and, you, you know, just do it that way. Most of the stuff, we're still old school in the sense we all get a room and we jam. We play because a lot of things happen when we do that. Mm -hmm. We can't, like, send each other our parts in an email. Right, right. Yeah, <laughs> you know? although although many bands do do that. But I hear what you're saying. You, yeah. you're, you're old school in that way and you want to kind of get in the room and kind of feel each other out. Only because a lot happens that wouldn't happen if you right. did email, emailing, you know, uh, something might happen with the drums that wouldn't even be happen unless we we're playing and looking at each other, you know, yeah. a lot of things stem from, from jamming. Uh, so, yeah. No, that's cool. Um, I mean, uh, as far as new music goes and stuff, is there anything currently or within the last couple of decades that might influence you? Any bands that you that you're digging on? Like uh, kind of, I guess, for lack of a better term, modern bands. Um, you know, I, I don't know about influencing me as far as like me changing the way I'd write or anything. But when we played with Greta Fleet, one thing I did love about them was they plug in, tune, and play. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's no tapes rolling or background vocals on tape or anything. You know, they, they might be a little out of tune, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. You know, and I liked how down-to-earth they were and how raw they were. They just plug in and go. And, like, they're talking to me two minutes before they went on stage, you know, they weren't like, oh, we got staged, let's do high fives and wig out and everything. It's <laughs> like, yeah, man, oh, you're shit, I've got to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're from here. Gang, 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 gang. You know, it was just like, I loved it. You know, it just reminded me of a band that got better because they played together in a garage. Maybe they weren't so good at first. And then, and then they kept playing together and they got better and better and better, you know. 
uh, that's what it reminded me of me when I was young trying to improve. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, uh, very human. And I like to see that with the younger bands that, you know, they, they're not really machine driven. Mm-hmm. They're, they're more like, dude, quit making that mistake or I'm going to kick your ass. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? It, it's like, I, I just, there's something about that. I, I just, you know, I actually kind of miss actually. Yeah. Those guys are from right here in Michigan. They, they were playing uh, in 2016. I think they were playing, you know, uh, uh, what is it like street fairs, you know, and then they just blew Amazing. up. Yeah. Yeah. They it's... blew up playing arenas, you know, uh, they're real down to earth too. And they're um, nothing gets them too excited. I mean, they're just like, cool, mm. you know? So yeah. I, I like to see that they're not overwhelmed by any stretch. Yeah, you just mentioned the thing that's kind of that seems to be the thing nowadays is uh, our bands using tracks or not using tracks. You know what I'm saying? It's it, that's like yeah. all, you just talked about the rags. It seems like that's that's what that's what people talk about all the time. I just don't like uh, one thing I'm not a fan of is auto tune. Yeah, because I think it's really changed for one country music and and just music in general. It's you know when you're a fan of a singer, they it's because they have a certain style. And and you're like, God, I love the way that dude sings, man. That Steven Tyler, he's so badass. He he don't sound like anybody, you know. What I mean, he he gets so into it, and uh, you know, he just squeezes the maximum out of everything. But when you put all that through auto tune, everybody kind of sounds similar. So you can you can't say that n- anymore, hmm. you know. And and that's what I don't like. I don't like the perfection stuff. Um, I've even had conversations with. Joe Wallace and other people, and they feel the same way. It's like when the Eagles play together, the reason they sound like the Eagles because they're playing together. Yeah. You, you know, mm-hmm. you don't have to put it through machines. And one thing we don't do is like look at a computer and see the bass note miss the kick drum by this much. If it sounds good to our ears, it is good. Yep. That's the way we treat it. We don't fix anything, we don't turn it into a machine. I mean, we can make it perfect right on the grid every mm-hmm. time, but you're really you're you're sucking the human element out of it, it and it, it's okay to listen to something and say, "Damn it, man, that's smoking. That's just so good," <laughs> you know. And oh, wait a minute, no, it isn't. Look, look right here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? right. As long as I'm it like, sounds good, right? I yeah, got as long as it sounds good, it's good, right? I mean, you know. We got to trust our ears, you know, some way. Yeah, Corey Taylor told me one time on the one Stone Sour record they did, they actually threw a blanket over the computer screen because they just wanted to record. There you go. That's what I'm talking about. It's like you can record quicker with it because you can do edits and, and it's good for that. You know, I like recording on two-inch tape, especially the drums and bass, mm-hmm. because there's definitely something to say about analog, the sound. It's so real that you envision people playing. I was at my drummer's not long ago. He was playing Foreigner 4 on a a vinyl. Mm -hmm. And I go, holy crap. I forgot all about that sound. Mm. You know? I I mean, digital's great. Okay, Uh, it's fine. But I think we were kind of tricked into thinking it's better because it's clear. It's almost like they took certain EQ out to make it clear. But when you're away from analog for a long time, you go back and listen to Foreigner 4, you go, you you can hear what's missing in a way. There, it still has all the punch, all the all the kick drum, all ballsy as hell. But there's there's this element of warmth in there right. uh, um, that that isn't with the digital, and that's why they're always comparing it to analog. If you've ever noticed, they're always going, it goes so fast right now, you can't even tell it's not, you know, or whatever. So the, in other words, what they're saying is, is they want to make it sound like analog, even though it's digital. So, yeah. You know what I mean? So, yeah, but no, when you I, go, but I've been away from it for so long that I, it kind of blew me away, actually. No, I'm a big vinyl it. fan. I listen to I listen to records every single day. That's just how it is at my house. But uh, yeah, you just you just mentioned Aerosmith. They're about to, uh, I I do believe, uh, talk about their uh, final tour. Do you ever think about your final tour? Um, not really. Um, I'm sure there will be. You know, a, a time where maybe we're not physically able to do it or whatever. But um, my energy is such 
like I, I've been sober for like 15 years and I, I have that teenage energy that music gives you when you're that age. Like mm-hmm. it, it, it actually gets me super excited. Like if I leave my guitar for two days and go to play it and something good happens, it's like, I, I, it's some kind of a, I, I don't know if you call it a high, it's just a, a certain feeling I get that I even got when I was young. Um, so yeah, I, I could imagine us, you know, you know, God, my knees hurting so damn bad, and you know, my elbows, you know, <laughs> my breathing ain't what it once was. I'm getting tired too easy, you know. If something like that happened, sure, I would, you know. Yeah, so, but that's good, man. Uh, they had a hell of a run. It's one of my favorite bands, and I'm pretty close to Steven Tyler. I mean, I've hung out with them. And uh, he's a good dude, man. He he really gets into the music. He can really feel that stuff. And he's very, very talented, man. He takes it serious. Well, we'll tell you what. We're uh, looking forward to uh, seeing you guys coming up at uh, Smugglers on uh, May the 5th in uh, Wyandotte. And, uh, um, you know, uh, don't be jealous that I'm going to be here in Detroit while you're sailing the high seas in the Monsters of Rock Cruise. <laughs> <laughs> right on, yeah. We're going to do that, and then, then we're going to get over to Smugglers. It's going to be cool, man. I think my friend Don Jameson is going to be on that cruise, correct? Is that oh, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, oh, I yeah love Don's him. badass. He's a great guy. Yeah, Don's He's one really of really nice guy. Man. Very personable. He he hangs out. He talks. He, he's a great guy, man. Yeah. Well, uh, Mark, always great to uh, touch base. Uh, I appreciate the time. Thanks for, thanks for having me, man.